So again, thank you everyone for showing up for this webinar, Scaling Advanced Grid Solutions, Pathways in Action. This will be about an hour, and I'm going to start with just some of the housekeeping things. Um, everyone who's entering the meeting will be on mute. This is because we expect quite a number of people, and we have quite a lot of information to share with you today. Um, so if you do have questions, please enter them in the Q&A function within Zoom, and we'll get to the ones we can at the end of the webinar. Uh, if we don't get to your question, we'll share them with the panelists, and hopefully you'll get everything, all your questions answered. Um, we are recording this session, uh, and we will post it on the Grid Forward YouTube channel for uh, you to see and to share more widely with your peers and associates. Uh, you see a uh, QR code for that in the lower right. Um, also, our, our first presenter, our first guest, Louise White, uh, did a presentation somewhat like this uh, on April 30th, and we have an article that summarizes some of her remarks then. So there's the QR code to that as well for further reading afterwards. So with that, Bryce, why don't you go ahead and take over? Thanks, David. Welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I think we're in the afternoon for everybody. Uh, and thanks for being on with us today. So uh, our session is really going to dive into some of the examples of advanced grid functionality uh, that uh, grid operators are putting into practice. And we're going to learn about what they are learning uh, from these experiences. Uh, really, the impetus for this session is coming from the new publication um, out from DOE and their Pathways um, series. So I'm going to bring on Louise White. Uh, she's going to share with us some of the uh, findings from their recent publication. Luis is a senior advisor at the DOE Office of uh, Technology Transitions. Um, it sits in the loan program office. Many of us know that as LPO. And so Luis, why don't you come on? Uh, look forward to hearing some of the summary from your recent publication and a little bit of the impetus as to the work that you guys are doing in this area. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Bryce, and great to be here with all of you. Um, so before diving into some of the highlights from the um, Innovative Grid Deployment Liftoff Report, um, do you want to set a little bit of the context for folks who are unfamiliar with our Pathways to Commercial Liftoff series of, of what this is and why we were focused on it at the DOE? Um, so the DOE, kind of out of the Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law, has really expanded its focus on the full commercialization spectrum including from our kind of home base of R&D, but all the way through deployment and demonstration of new energy technologies. And so with that expanded focus on the deployment side of the house, um, we were, I think kind of question came up of, of what is the state of play for different clean energy sectors? And that um, question helped launch this Pathways to Commercial Liftoff series, which is going sector by sector by different new energy technologies and really trying to understand where are these uh, markets today? And what do we think the path is to full deployment at scale and, and kind of commercial liftoff um, in the long term for these solutions? Um, and the, these reports are intended to be fact bases, both for uh, the DOE's own use of understanding these sectors, as well as for uh, private markets to help kind of understand where, where these areas are and, and what the path forward is. Um, so we've gone covered many different topics, but I will focus on our innovative grid deployment effort that we just published um, a few weeks ago. And um, I'll plan to, to give some of the highlights of what we covered and why um, the opportunity at stake that we see with some of these advanced grid solutions, and then what it takes to get to liftoff um, and deployment at scale to really capture the opportunity that's in front of us. Um, and I hope I'll be able to team up a little bit of the national view um, and then very excited to turn it over to the other industry leaders on the call to I think, really hear what it's like actually deploying these on the ground because I know that's um, of utmost importance to get more deployments out the door. But first, okay, innovative grid deployment, what are we talking about here? So in this effort, we were specifically focused on um, looking at the existing transmission and distribution infrastructure. And in particular, looking at how commercially available advanced grid solutions can be deployed to enhance that existing infrastructure in the near term. Um, I want to be very clear that we still critically need new um, transmission, new generation, new distribution, all of the above. Um, but we know it takes years to build that out. And while there are other efforts at DOE and beyond, including the, the FERC um, ruling yesterday that hopefully will help speed up um, new transmission efforts, 
we were really focused on what is the opportunity in the near term to enhance the existing grid that we've already paid for to help meet um, capacity, reliability, resilience needs, and really modernize the existing system to, to pave the way for a clean energy future. Uh, so that was our, our kind of primary focus here. And I think that the reason for that near-term focus um, likely won't be a surprise to, to folks on the call, um, but a few of the key trends that we were looking at, of course, um, demand growth, um, that we are at an inflection point where we expect to see uh, significant demand growth in the near term uh, with, um, I think, NERC projecting around 91 gigawatts to come online in the next decade, um, expect that to be even higher. And while we've been anticipating low growth to happen um, with the NREL study cited here uh, that was looking at potential demand growth um, in a variety of, of clean energy scenarios, uh, we are we recognize that some of this low growth is happening in particular regions even quicker than expected, um, whether that's from onshoring manufacturing, electrification of EVs, or data centers and AI applications. Um, I think needing solutions that can help us respond to that uh, near-term need uh, which can and leveraging the existing system to respond effectively is is critical. Um, and while we don't just need to um, enhance the system to support demand, um, also recognizing that we have a very old grid um, that is going to be um, replaced and, and upgraded in the near term, with an estimated thirty percent of transmission and sixty percent of distribution lines that are um, operating near or above their end of life. Uh, which is both a challenge, I think, as we think about having to replace this old system, but also an opportunity that while we're doing those replacements, can we leverage newer and more advanced grid technologies to uh, modernize the system while we're doing um, this routine replacement? And of course, um, if we didn't have to add to the list of pressures, um, recognizing that there are significant external pressures um, that continue to, to stress the grid, um, whether it is uh, extreme weather events, um, different uh, physical or cyber threats, uh, really recognizing a need to both enhance the resilience and reliability um, of the grid while we continue to support um, economic growth and, and demand growth over time. Uh, so those were some of the pressures that, that we were recognizing as, um, as really imperative to, to start responding to and, and helped inform the scope for what we were looking at here. Um, but I think the spoiler alert is that there are options available to help us respond um, quickly and cost effectively to these systems. And so that was what this innovative grid deployment liftoff report was focused on. So in this effort, we looked at um, a suite of 20 available grid technologies um, over four categories that I will walk through now. First are advanced transmission technologies, including advanced conductors and HVDC lines, which can expand capacity on the existing transmission infrastructure on existing rights of way. Um, so advanced conductors, for example, can expand capacity upwards of 1.5 to 3X without having to um, always expand your right of way, which can get into to permitting and other challenges. Second category, situational awareness and system automation solutions, um, including a variety of um, advanced distribution management solutions, ADMS, and their advanced applications like bolt bar optimization, VVO, and DERMS, distributed energy resource management systems. Um, kind of a suite of solutions that can really help improve visibility and control on the distribution side and um, help respond more quickly to um, if it's a, a fault and kind of automate the system to help reduce outages. Um, so that's like an ADMS Blizzard application or DERMS, which it can help us more safely and quickly integrate um, distributed energy resources and then use those um, in more advanced applications like virtual power plants. Third category, grid enhancing technologies and applications um, include both transmission solutions like dynamic line rating and advanced power flow control that I know here a bit more about today um, that can help us with these solutions kind of categorized being able to help us use the existing system more efficiently, help us tap into either unlock, uh, um, unlock capacity on the existing transmission system so that we're better utilizing and, and optimizing those systems. Um, and then applications like virtual power plants and energy storage can help us uh, manage demand and um, again, kind of optimize a system to respond most effectively to, to system needs. And then the last category that we were looking at were foundational systems um, that underpin a lot of these advanced applications. So things like data management systems or communications technologies that are really prerequisites to being able to uh, support um, a modern, modern grid and these advanced um, grid technologies. 
So this was the suite of options that we covered. Um, and I think one observation as we look at this very busy slide here um, is that there are a range of tools that can be used across both the transmission and distribution system to respond to grid needs. And so I think intention here is not to say that we have to use all of these in this exact combination. There is not a one size fits all approach here, uh, but really looking at these um, 20 technologies as tools in the toolbox that um, utilities and regulators can pull from in individually or in different combinations to address their own uh, individual needs, topology, realities, and, and goals. So this is what we covered. Um, why, why are we excited about these? What, what's the opportunity at stake if we were to deploy these? So we looked at um, first the capacity impact, the system capacity impact that would happen if we um, deploy these solutions at scale across the existing grid. And that's what you're seeing here. So there are two ways um, that these technologies can enhance capacity on the system. Um, the first set, the dark green here, help us increase effective transmission capacity on the bulk system. So these are things like advanced conductors or dynamic line rating that can help us um, tap into and expand capacity on the existing system. There's also technologies like energy storage or virtual power plants um, that help provide capacity relief um, through non-wires investments. Um, so virtual power plants, for example, can help us harness the distributed energy resources that are out on the system and coordinate those to um, help manage peak demand or provide even grid services to the, the broader grid um, to, to serve demand and really provide kind of some of the upstream um, transmission relief that um, you know, is in, in um, high demand at the moment. So we performed an exercise that looked at you know, what would happen if we snapped our fingers and deployed these technologies at scale across the existing US grid in the places where they're technically and economically viable, what's the order of impact, order of magnitude of the impact they could deliver? And what we found is that at scale, these technologies could support upwards of 20 to 100 gigawatts of additional peak demand. So that's anywhere from around five to 15% to greater peak demand um, from current uh, US demand of 750 gigawatts. And that is on the order of magnitude of the 91 gigawatts that NERC is projecting to come online in the next decade. So deploying these at scale could generate really meaningful system impact. And this is just when we look at these individually. So if we think about stacking these technologies up and deploying them in different combinations across the system, the potential impact could be even greater. And these technologies don't just help with um, capacity. Uh, they also can bring a host of other meaningful benefits, um, including improved reliability and resilience, um, partly from helping us just improve our visibility on the system so we know what's happening and can respond more effectively during a time of crisis, as well as automate the system to reduce, um, reduce reliability and, and outage issues altogether. They can help improve affordability outcomes for customers by improving energy efficiency and lowering energy costs. They can help advance sustainability goals by um, unlocking capacity to reduce curtailment of existing resources or help bring on um, new clean energy resources more quickly, as well as integrate other clean distributed energy resources. And we see an opportunity that if managed effectively and intentionally, an opportunity to enhance energy justice and equity outcomes as well, not only by improving affordability outcomes and reducing energy burdens, but also improving um, visibility and, and a better understanding of um, how disadvantaged communities are currently served so that we can respond more effectively to their needs. And because these tools use the existing system, uh, many can be very quick to deploy and can be that kind of near-term bridge as um, system expansion and new transmission and distribution infrastructure is built out over time. Um, so we find, I think, I'll leave it to our experts here to, to talk more about their deployment experiences. But what we heard from across the industry was, um, while it might take one to three years, the first time a utility tries to deploy one of these technologies to get some of that foundational system in place, rapid scale up can happen in a matter of months for most of these. Um, additionally, many of these solutions are very low cost relative to conventional alternatives. Um, with some of the grid enhancing technologies, for example, like dynamic line rating or advanced power flow control, costing less than five to 25% of the cost of conventional wired alternatives. 
So we see a lot of value at stake here. Um, I think the, the natural question comes up that, you know, if these technologies are ready to go, they can bring a lot of value to our system. Why aren't they being deployed at scale? Or in our um, Pathways to Commercial Liftoff talk, what's holding liftoff back? And that is a question that we have spent um, the last several months um, talking to stakeholders from across the public and private um, landscape to, to answer. Oh, sorry, I realized I skipped ahead of my presentation. Uh, so it's actually the spoiler alert of why aren't we seeing um, greater deployments is um, that while we have seen some deployments from industry today, we haven't seen deployment at scale. So uh, as of 2023, $87 billion um, was spent on the transmission and distribution system, but less than 7% of that was going towards advanced technologies. And so what is holding liftoff back? So first, what does liftoff mean in this context? Um, first, it means that liftoff will be achieved when these solutions become a core part of utility and regulators planning and operational toolkit. So recognize that they are not always going to be the solution for every priority. We still need new transmission. We will still need conventional asset replacements. Uh, what we see is the need to make sure that they are at least considered in the option set. So we know that we're pulling the best tool from the toolkit to most effectively um, meet grid needs and drive the best customer outcome. So I think the question I always ask myself is, um, if we aren't even considering the full option set in front of us, how do we know we're getting to the most um, cost-effective outcome for American households? So if liftoff is getting needs to be a core part of the toolkit, what does it take to get there? Um, first, we need to deploy no regret solutions today with six to 12 large infield deployments completed across a diverse set of utility contexts. So we heard a lot of times that it's very challenging to be a first mover in this space, uh, but it's easier to be a fast follower. And so see a need to get to liftoff to support a cadre of first movers like folks that you're on the, the call today uh, to get some successful deployments and successful proof points out in the field to enable faster uptake at scale. But it's not enough just to deploy the technologies. Um, also need, see a need to address four liftoff priorities to help address the challenges holding these solutions back and de-risk adoption at scale. Um, those four priorities are first, um, building and transparently sharing the bank of industry evidence for these technologies value proposition so that industry regulators and, and broader stakeholders can better understand what these technologies are and the value they can bring to the grid. Second, developing implementation and operational know-how um, to help reduce the execution friction to actually get these out in the field. Third, refining the planning and investment case approach so that these solutions can be integrated into core planning processes and that their full benefits and costs are comprehensively and fairly evaluated to inform cost-effective investment decisions. And lastly, a need to align economic models and incentives um, to ensure that um, industry's financial incentive um, is sufficient to warrant the effort that it takes to deploy these technologies. Uh, but we see an opportunity because these technologies are available and use the existing system to uh, really focus in, and move rapidly here and um, achieve liftoff and get these to be part of our core, core toolkit within three to five years. And um, last important note here before turning to, to a few resources to leave you with, um, we see an opportunity for these solutions to start being deployed without increasing cost to ratepayers, whether that is by using existing replacement investment to proactively upgrade those assets with advanced grid solutions instead of replacing kind of like for like as is common today. Um, also an opportunity to develop new cost allocation mechanisms. Um, for example, with a lot of data centers coming online, potential opportunities to develop new tariffs for data centers to pay um, a larger share of the cost of grid upgrades. And lastly, um, an opportunity to leverage federal funding and resources to support deployments and further um, de-risk and, and smooth the adoption of these. And on that note, um, these are a lot of resources here, so um, I think they'll be available in the slides afterwards, but do want to note that um, the DOE recognizes this is a big, a big change. These technologies um, can be, are new for, for many utilities in the space. Um, and so are uh, bringing a lot of resources to bear in a few different forms, including direct grants, through the Grid Deployment Office's GRIP program that can support these types of solutions, um, loans and financing tools, 
technical assistance, as well as a variety of other um, technology tools and resources. Um, so these are, we're continuing to build and expand these, um, but certainly wanna make sure you all know that there are resources at the federal level to help support deployments out in the field. And with that, let me wrap up with just, I know we've covered a lot um, and I wanna turn it over to, to our leaders in the field. Um, my last closing thoughts here of, of what is it gonna take for us to get to lift off? Three next steps to leave you with. Um, first, just proactively and rigorously evaluating these solutions um, and then strategically deploying them where they make sense to address the grid hotspots that we're seeing today. Um, and then second, leveraging federal funding and resources to support those deployments. And then third, I think this webinar is a great example of the need for more collaboration and transparent information sharing of the deployments that have and will be happening soon so that we can see broader industry adoption and um, scale up more quickly. And with that, let me stop and turn it back over to Bryce. Thanks, Louise, for the overview. Um, easy to shout out to check out the liftoff report if you have not, and we will be sending you those links as well. Uh, so Farouk, Nassim, come on off your proverbial uh, virtual mute and into our conversation here. Uh, Farouk is the supervising principal engineer at Sacramento Municipal Utility District. Quite a mouthful. So they go by SMUD as uh, almost everybody knows them by. Um, SMUD, uh, as the name alludes to, serves the greater Sacramento, California area. Um, and they're a municipal utility. Uh, they're in my time zone here on the Pacific Coast. And uh, over to you, Farouk. Give us some uh, great examples of what, we, what you all are working through. Sure. Thank you, Bryce. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, just a quick overview. Um, you know, what I'll hope to to share with you all um, in the time I have is uh, some of the innovative work we're doing here at SMUD um, through our DERMS and ADMS platform. Um, just some background for you. We deployed um, our ADMS and DERMS uh, in 2022. And so we've been live with it for about 18 months. Um, and and really the, the driver for us was to um, kind of what Luis mentioned was, you know, um, uh, taking some of our legacy systems and and um, finding ways to to integrate them into a, a, a holistic uh, tool that our operators in the distribution control room could use, um, and then also um, realizing that with the proliferation of uh, distributed energy resources that we're having in SMUD, um, the need to start integrating those and, and developing tools that would be able to utilize those resources um, as they um, uh, increase on our system. Uh, just some numbers for you. you know, we're, we're seeing about four to 6,000 new PV uh, installs. Um, we're expecting about 1,000 battery storage systems uh, to be installed in our system every year. We're adding about ten to fifteen thousand electric vehicles. So all of those new re those um, um, resources, well, uh, devices, let's say, we consider as potential resources for us to support um, um, our distribution grid and then ultimately um, uh, even the transmission uh, grid as well. So um, that's hope. Uh, that's my goal to sh what to share with you. Um, some of the other things, um, you know. With the deployment of our ADMS and DERMS, um, you know, there's a, a, a period of, of um, adjustment, refinement, improvement, and some of the things uh, I'll, I'll share with you, you know, evolving from an advisory uh, mode for specifically for our Flither application, uh, um, transitioning it to an automatic mode, what that journey look like for us. Um, some of the, the work we're doing in our DERM space, for example, we are currently testing um, some of the, the latest development that we've um, um, gotten from our vendor and, and um, some of the, the challenges we have with um, being able to support and integrate disparate vendors, um, disparate systems, um, the need for standardization um, of protocols, um, and and the ability to to um, make those systems interoperable, so that we're not developing a custom solution that isn't applicable to other utilities. We'd like something that you know um, plug and play. Let's uh, let's say so. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So as, as part of our ADMS uh, deployment, we um, 
we currently have our bolt var control vvc system uh, and that application uh, works uh, uh, on uh, a bio violations based mode so um, based on all of the, the the data that we're collecting from the field the ADMS um, BVC application identifies um, violations that are occurring um, whether they're voltage or VAR or power factor and and um, uh, automatically corrects those. So that's, that's what we have deployed. Um, and uh, again, the, the, the VVO volt bar optimization is kind of the next step we are currently testing um, to, to um, uh, deploy that. The goal is late sometime later this year, Q3 uh, or Q4 of 2024, um, our, um, like it says there, our um, ADMS platform and DERMS are um, from OSI, Open Systems International. But, um, you know, part of the, the goal for our VVO deployment is to um, support uh, reducing power losses, um, supporting demand reduction, and then power factor correction um, through our um SMUD assets like our um, uh, line capacitors or substation capacitors, but really the, the next step for us is to integrate distributed and DER, distributed energy resources into our volt var optimization application. So utilizing um, whether it's um, uh, resources such as synchronous generators that can can uh, modify their VARs or utilizing uh, DERs with smart inverters that can inject uh, bars. So, so that's the testing we're doing now on some of that functionality to be able to incorporate, um, yeah, like I mentioned, the, the 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 large numbers of the distributed resources that we have in our in our um, uh, distribution system. Utilize those to support. Um, our uh, grid for the, the applications and the examples that are listed there. So uh, next slide, please. Um, as far, like I mentioned, our ADMS FLIZR stands for Fault Location Isolation and Service Restoration. Um, you know, part of the transition we had, um, we, we had FLIZR as part of our um, deployment in 2022, but um, we left it in an advisory mode. Um, really, uh, you know, the, the, the last 18, 19 months we've utilized to, um, one, determine if, if the solutions that we're getting from our FLIZR um, application are satisfactory to our operators, right? They're the ones with the experience. They're the ones that, that do this on a day-to-day -day basis. We want them to feel comfortable with the solutions that are being provided. So we left that flitter in an advisory mode and our engineers and operators work closely together to, to review outages that we were seeing. And, um, and, and I think coming up pretty shortly, we're gonna, to transition to that automatic uh, deployment. So essentially what that means is um, if there's an outage on our 69 kV sub transmission system, um, rather than having an operator uh, review data or get information and then determine what remote switching operations they can do to, to restore um, power to the most, uh, um, you know, in the most uh, advantageous way to isolate the, the fault, um, Blizzard through ADMS will do that. And so your response time and your restoration times uh, uh, can see significant decreases. Um, and so uh, while that's on our sub-transmission system, we made an, a, a conscious choice to do that because our, our sub-transmission system has a bigger well, bang for its buck because we that that outages on that system impact far more customers than um, the 12 and 21 kV distribution system that we have. Um, so that's on our roadmap to, to um, um, you know, in, implement Flitter on those uh, distribution uh, circuits that we have, but um, our focus right now is on the 69 sub-transmission where, where, where it has the greater impact. Um, so really some of the, the things that I, I kind of mentioned briefly already that um, you know, we considered as part of this deployment to go from an advisory to an automatic mode where those um, you know, working with our vendor, working with our operators, um, ensuring that we had equipment in the field that was, was um, working properly. Uh, that's a little bit of a, a, another reason for um, our delay was we don't wanna be utilizing equipment that isn't gonna give us the right information to to provide solutions that will um, uh, uh, 
restore power and not cause problems on the system. And then lastly, like I mentioned, building trust um, and, and tweaking the software to, to provide that optimal solution. Next slide, please. Um, and then lastly, then, um, you know, in, in our DERM space, we are doing a lot of work. Like I mentioned, we're doing some, uh, we deployed um, a, a, an initial phase of DERMs um, uh, when we went live with ADMS, which was focused primarily on visibility and um, some controls uh, to the, the, the DERs that were controllable. Um, so, so that was the the goal was to give operators that that view of where these resources are on our distribution system so they can be aware of them it's kind of the next step um in our development is to um uh provide use those resources to provide localized benefits like i mentioned in the vvo slide um utilizing those resources for um uh resolving um back feeds grid conditions such as voltage abnormalities, um, the reducing power loss, for example. Um, but besides that, you know, in at SMUD, we, we've currently got a, a B1G pilot we're trying we're we're actively looking at EV managed charging to to utilize um, EVs as a, a resource that can be deployed, um, you know, uh, whether it's through a third party or through some type of direct control, that's again some of the 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 the, the questions we're asking ourselves. What is that, that ideal uh, solution? We don't have an answer yet, so we're not we're we're agnostic in terms of what is that that solution. And I would be ecstatic if someone could give me an answer to that question. What is that solution? How are you all um, um, thinking about that? But um, we have uh, also we're customer programs that we're uh, testing with PV, batteries, water heaters. Um, one of the vendors we're working with is Virtual Peaker to, to do some of that water heater um, uh, customer program deployment. Uh, we also have a whole host of projects um, in, in flight and on our roadmap with regard to vehicle to grid, so you know, dual charging and, and discharging of those those resources, um, microgrid projects, um, and then localized solutions for for peak. So through a, a VPP, deploying batteries, and then um, uh, throughout our system, like I mentioned, we're expecting at least a hundred a thousand per year and ramping up um, the. Uh, you know, not not really in the far term, closer to the near term, we're going to ramp those uh, deployments up quite a bit. Um, and and again, the, the goal is to utilize all of those through our DERM distributed energy resource management system to to be able to um, uh, address grid conditions and then ultimately even um, support transmission issues. Um, uh, we saw some of the 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 transmission uh, resources and, and solutions that were available, but that's our, our, our goal aim. Is, and then lastly, also utilizing these resources in a, in a market um, um, to, to support uh, market needs for SMUD. And um, lastly, you know, we have a research yard that we're, we're, we're building out, um, you know, to, to test innovative um, battery technology solutions. Right now we have a lithium ion battery and then we're, we're, we're uh, installing and testing a long duration energy storage battery sy system there. Uh, but the plan is to utilize that. So there's, when we see new and innovative technology, uh, we can um, have a, a, an area, a research yard that can um, help us um, develop, test, and then ultimately deploy those uh, throughout our district. Fantastic. Thanks, Farouk. Thank you. Uh, Marie Steele is up next, and um, each of our next three will probably have you saved down in a minute or two, so we can wrap up on time here today. Uh, Marie is the Vice President of Integrated Energy Services at NV Energy uh, Distribution, uh, grid operator as a part of the Berkshire Hathaway uh, Energy Group of Companies. You'll see some similarities on the distribution work that they've done with SMUD and some other examples that they're going to jump into. Over to you, Marie. 
Awesome. Thanks, Bryce. I was going to say the same thing with almost ditto to SMUD. Um, and so <laughs> I'll, I'll walk through um, how we're looking at this from, from NB Energy's perspective. Um, one, and, and give some, some helpful feedback on how things are approaching this when I know sometimes it, it can be a little bit of anxiety inducing on what's hearing about what's going on on the West Coast and specifically in California, right? And so here at NB Energy, actually, we created a new group two years ago called the Integrated Energy Services Team, because really organizationally to be able to transform customer solutions into a meaningful grid resource, we needed to actually be able to structure to do that. And so now we have our renewable programs, our EV programs, energy efficiency programs, our DR programs, our electrification programs, also an R&D and lab development and then technology implementation and development transitioning from our existing de demand response management system to an advanced integrated terms. And so having all of that together with our integrated grid planning and quite frankly, very fortunate to have um, two members of the team used to run our distribution planning. So we are always mindful of what is the grid need and what are our customer needs and how can we make them together to bring, bring down that cost effectiveness and advanced solutions. So organizationally, really step one, super helpful. And if you go to the next slide, um, making a plan, right? How do utilities look at this? How does our regulator look at this? And so um, NB Energy's had a distributed resource plan requirement since 2017. And so we've really evolved our learning on how we are going to integrate distributed energy resources over the past years. Um, we infamously have the walk, jog, run uh, framework on, on what we need to do to, to do this. And as we look at our non wireless alternatives, as we look at how we're integrating with our different customer components, one of the biggest things actually was making our new group, right? And so how do we take our already approved customer programs and turn them into a distributed, into a meaningful grid resource, right? We have a lot of excess capacity, especially in Southern Nevada. And so we have this amazing opportunity to, if we can move move load, right? You're relieving some of that distribution constraint, hopefully as we scale them, some of the transmission constraint, right? And so, or moving things to where we have excess renewable energy. So that takes a plan, that takes transparency with your regulator, that takes transparency with um, your stakeholders, right? And so how you develop these together. This one is actually our one from last year and we are on May 31st of this month um, filing our next triennial IRP. So we'll have an even stronger advancement of what we thought from a year ago. Integrating federal opportunities has been hugely transformational over the past couple of years, right? How do you bring on additional funding to advance these solutions? Um, so really, I would start with, you know, it's easy to jump into technologies really quickly, but think about if you're organizationally set up for success and also have a plan to be transparent about how you're going to do this. But I'll quickly just go through a couple of our use cases that we have ongoing right now in the next slide for um, just some of the things that we do with existing technologies. Some of the very easiest ones that you already have, right? I think everybody from a grid operator and, a, and a, a utility has energy efficiency programs, right? And so where you know if you have grid constraints, geo-targeting your marketing to the, your programs just there is very simple, right? Doesn't take a whole lot of integration. We've matured, right, that thought of how we can actually do locational dispatch of our demand response technologies. So we've had a very long standing air conditioning program, right? But we also have direct load control. And so we've started in 2019 doing local dispatch for operational issues, not just economic issues. And so providing that for our operations team on substations when they're having grid constraint events, right? So that that locational dispatch of demand response technologies, we're really excited to be able to expand that to more technologies going forward. Um, another one that we're working on is using transit and school bus batteries as a grid resource, right? Um, it's programs we're already doing, we're providing incentives for the batteries. And hopefully when I think of that one scaling in Southern Nevada, it's one school district and 2000 school buses across five fleet yards, right? I think when you think of that, that can be pretty amazing if we can figure out that capacity um, and it's quite frankly, larger than a, um, a power plant in school bus batteries for the summer is something we're really excited to, to figure out. And then a, another one that we're working on, which actually is a DOE grant, um, is energy storage as a service, our grid services grant. So using actually distribution level batteries at substations to provide solutions as storage shares to customers as we think about how we have a gigawatt of net metering, right? Providing additional battery solutions for 
for our NEM customers. And so those are just a couple of things that we're thinking about, hopefully providing um, some ideas for folks on the call today. And I appreciate the opportunity, Bryce. Excellent. Thanks, Marie. We're going to pivot. Maybe we'll think about it going up grid. Uh, upstream might be a little bit more familiar to us thinking about it that way. Uh, but uh, come on in, Alex Gina Jackson, the VP of Strategic Development at AES. Um, AES uh, has uh, distribution utilities in Indiana, Ohio, maybe some others that I missed. Alex Gina, you can let us know about and uh, operates uh, clean energy assets in a number of jurisdictions. Uh, so they'll be kind of the second of our IOUs uh, joining us today. Uh, coming from the East Coast in this example, over to you. Thanks, Bryce. And I'll move through the slides, the first few slides pretty quickly, and then spend the bulk of my time towards the end of the deck. Uh, but really quick context setting, you're right, Bryce, we have both utilities at AES as well as uh, clean energy development, owning and operating. We're in 14 countries, but my comments will really focus on the U.S. because that is our fastest area of growth. Um, AES has been, for the last several years, the number one provider of energy to CNI customers. So you might appreciate that we're laser focused on, uh, you know, load growth, and specifically since we're serving big tech in big ways, um, you know, understanding this step change load, getting it onto the grid, is a key challenge both for our customers in our renewables business as well as us. Um, and then in our utilities, those same step change loads are coming into our utility footprint and needing service. And we're very interested in serving them while maintaining excellent service to all of our grid customers and ensuring equity in the grid transformation. So if you move to the next slide, um, this means that not only do we need more energy, but we need more infrastructure to serve that energy up to our customers. Um, so that's really what the first line on here lays out clearly. We need a lot of additional transmission capacity. Um, and that capacity is, uh, you know, enhanced or sort of as a, as a cycle here impacted by the images at the bottom. Uh, as we see changes in the system around the location of energy consumption production, that we're now increasingly aware that our production of energy, consumption of energy, and even transmission of energy is dynamic. As we are stressed by our uh, existing constraints around planning and interconnection and trying to solve those, as we're adding new technologies into the grid to improve our carrying capacity, these can all improve, but also demand additional um, capabilities within the transmission system. So that's a bit of the context setting for how and why AES is focusing on these issues so closely. In the next slide, you'll see that we're thinking about how do we reduce the call on the transmission system if it is a source of bottleneck, which we believe it to be. Here are three things that we're considering. Um, co-location of assets. So for example, how do we call less on the transmission system by delivering energy directly to customers where that is a good solution? On the other side, you see the word flattened. The idea there is how might we actually um, optimize our use of energy within the distribution system such that we are calling again less on the transmission system for those big peaks. If we make our load curves from the distribution system le less peaky, more predictable, we may be able to better use our transmission system because we feel more confident in what the demand on the resource is going to be. We hold back less reserve in the system and we serve it up with greater efficiency. So there's the essential box on this slide, the efficiency box. And that's where I'm going to dig in deeper on the next slide. So as we think about efficiency at AES, there are a number of solutions that we would put in the grid enhancing technologies box or GETS. And you'll see in the headline there, we think of them both alone and combined, as Louise was mentioning. One thing that's not on this slide that is certainly a solution, we think, to transmission capacity is advanced conductors. It's not on here because we see it as a, an additional solution for wires, and these are technologies that enhance the wires. So left to right, certainly storage is transmission, not one that is always within the three core grid enhancing technologies but one, obviously, AES is very pro-storage. In addition, as you saw Luis's slides, a great source of value for grid enhancing. Um, you then go through advanced power flow control, dynamic line rating, topology optimization, the classic trio of GETs on here. You might think of them both as visualization technologies as well as control technologies. And so we add another category at the end of this slide, visualization and control, that not only 
references sort of the way dynamic line rating can help you see the grid that's already in place and how the other gets named can help you control the power flows on the grid. But in fact, we believe that there are platforms that are in progress and will have great impact on the grid that help you combine that visualization of both assets and power flows, as well as the ability to optimally control the grid to provide a full solution set where all of these tools in this toolbox will be able to be used to their optimal ability. So if we dig in on DLR, we can move to the next slide. And I'll talk to you a little bit about AES's recent deployment in our utilities, both Indiana and Ohio, of 42 sensors. And we selected very specifically five strategic lines for their impact to benefit our customers. So you'll see on the right hand side of the slide, some of the benefits that we considered. There are more, and I will recommend to you our case study for a table that's in there that says specifically what is the grid impact and benefit that we saw for each line, as well as the customer benefit. Um, but on the left-hand side, you see the, what I've uh, numbered as lesson one here, which is as we deployed um, a dynamic line rating onto a very specific 30, a 345 kV line in our system, we saw great impact, right? A great visibility into additional headroom that was on the line. Now, I'll make sure you understand that this is six months of data, and this six months of data relates to cooler times of the year. If you're familiar with dynamic line rating, uh, which is effectively uh, visualizing the carrying capacity of the transmission line, in other words, how much can the conductor provide energy transmission, um, cooler weather is often beneficial, right, to that, as well as wind across, flowing across the conductor. Those things allow the line to carry more energy. So I make sure to be clear on that because these are big numbers. Right, 61% additional headroom made visible through dynamic line rating is a big number. 23% um, over ambient adjusted ratings, we call that out specifically because there is a question in the market, is DLR really needed if you already have ambient adjusted? And we find that yes, wind is extremely impactful and DLR adds in wind as a component when calculating line rating. You'll see below those big numbers, um, the savings. Right, so we have we found that in our deployment, we could deploy DLR for around forty-five thousand dollars per mile, and what you have here is twenty years of SAS fees. So we made sure not just to put the deployment cost, but the actual all-in twenty-year cost of using this solution, because that is what is comparable to the alternative, which would have been reconductoring. So these are apples to apples comparisons. In the interest of time, we'll move on to a next lesson, lesson number two. So this is a different line. This is a 69 kV line. Um, and this one, we wanted to make sure we looked at 69 kV because that's what a lot of the grid is made up of these days, not just those big 330, 345 kV lines. And here with this deployment, you can see um, some visualization of different segments because the dynamic line rating is deployed throughout the line at different um, intervals. And you can see that in segment 34 on the top and 40 on the bottom, the blue line, which is dynamic line rating, is dancing there over top of the static line, which is the black line in the chart. But when you look at segment 37, you actually see that the static rating is above the dynamic blue line. So dynamic line rating is not just for visualizing the headroom that is available in the system, but also understanding through situational awareness where the static line rating may actually be higher than the line's capacity for carrying energy. That's an important learning as well for reliability. And what it allowed us to do in this instance is to dig into line 37 or segment 37 and say, why is this happening? And what we found was that that segment 37 is in a very constrained corridor. You weren't getting wind, there was a lot of vegetation. And so we were able to strategically say, okay, by reconducting that half mile segment that represents segment 37, we can actually provide dynamic line rating results where it's 10% above static rating and 14% above ambient adjusted rating. So through a targeted investment strategy, not only are we saving our customers money, but we're providing the benefits of additional headroom. And on the last slide, uh, we get to, I think, a, maybe an important third lesson, which is just looking at where people say dynamic line rating is scary because it's dynamic. Recognize that the lines are dynamic inherently, 
And by imposing static ratings, which, which is what you see here in sort of this jagged line, is in the seasonal adjustment of static ratings, you actually see that just based on a calendar day, we're changing uh, the, the line rating that is being applied in operations of the system where the dynamic rating itself does not change. It continues its dynamic movement throughout the system. You suddenly have this just block change in the static rating. And this shows to me, at least, that once we have the higher fidelity and clearer view of how the system actually operates, we should start making different decisions about the ratings that we're putting into operations and into planning, because when we have visibility, we know better and we can use better information. Thanks, Bryce. The last page, if you don't mind just flashing it really quickly, gives people links to the two reports that we have out recently. And thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Alcina. Taking us home, uh, Dick Persley, come on in. He's the Director of Operations and Transmission Services at Great River Energy in Minnesota. Um, they're a wholesale electric co-op serving, I think I said 27 member co-ops. So we've been in all time zones. We've had municipal uh, IOU and now co-op member uh, structures at the operators. And Dick has some additional insights to round us off. Thanks, Bryce. Um, appreciate the opportunity. Um, as Bryce mentioned, we're uh, a little different. We're a, a cooperative, a nonprofit serving 27 member systems. So we don't um, serve the end use customer. But however, we do supply services to the distribution members. So we are in some of the other spheres that were mentioned um, earlier today as far as distribution services and, and the management systems that serve them. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly about our DLR deployment. Um, we started this um, a little later than the previous speaker, probably in the last six months with the pilot, and then we've expanded recently. You can go to the next slide. So um, as you know, as kind of, you know, I could say ditto probably too. Um, some of the benefits, our focus is really on um, congestion costs because uh, market congestion is big. Um, uh, the new uh, kind of what the regulators are really focused on, especially in Minnesota and, and in other places in, in the MISO market. And with that, we looked for opportunities to, um, lower some of those congestion costs, especially with some of the um, more movement of power across um, Minnesota with some recent retirements that we've had. And being a wind-rich area, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Western um, Minnesota, um, that can have a, a, it can vary greatly um, through the course of the day or, or the course of the week, depending on conditions. So we really wanted to look at those specific facilities that um, utilizing some um, specific market congestion software, modeling software, where we could get the most bang for our buck by this deployment, because we are somewhat resource limited by being a nonprofit. So, um, you know, we, we selected a, a pilot line. We, um, tested it out. We looked at different vendors and um, we put four sensors on the initial deployment. And if you can go to the next slide, we selected um, Heimdall Power as our partner in this effort. And they're a technology company headquartered in Oslo. They recently uh, came on site to visit us and we kicked off um, after the pilot a more um, extensive deployment where we purchased 52 sensors from them covering eight different line segments that we had identified. Um, we, they actually have technology where um, they can use virtual neurons in some cases, depending on if cell coverage is available or not. So we have a couple of facilities that we're gonna test that out, their virtual option which doesn't give you the full benefit, but it provides a kind of, a, a, I would say, a, a medium endpoint between AR technology and the full-scale DER deployment. And the sensors are, um, I think you'll see one on the next slide, but um, they, they're measuring 
uh, inclination, uh, the temperature of the the conductor, ambient temperature, and they use local weather stations to take this information in, bring it into their cloud, and then we interface with their cloud environment. If you go to the next slide. So here's kind of a, a quick view. We serve um, basically 27 members exclusively in Minnesota from all the way to Canada down to Iowa. So it's a pretty large um, service territory and those are the facilities that we selected. Some of those are um, constrained by, uh, I would say, um, north to south or LMP flows. Some of them are interconnections with wind, wind rich areas. So there's kind of a, a mixture of those and they're mainly 100 kV and above facilities. Um, in the metro area, you see right above Minneapolis, those are 230 kV systems that we're um, putting this deployment on. One of the unique things is the, um, the neuron can be installed using a drone technology, and they actually use AI with, the, um, uh, with LiDAR to the pilot flies it close to the conductor, um, they engage the um, the AI um, software, and then it installs the um, neuron and, and disconnects, and it immediately starts um, communicating to the cloud-based system. So, um, you know, all your line information is provided to Heimdall. Um, they use those parameters to calculate the actual um, dynamic line rating of that line based on the locations where those neurons are are, are um, installed. Um, we're right in the process. In fact, we're doing so today. We're installing um, some of the 52 as we speak, and we hope to have um, all of them deployed by the end of this month. Um, it really frees up our line technicians um, hands and also we don't have to get into some really swampy places to um, install these with hot sticks and, and you can do it with the line energized. Next slide, please. So really the preliminary learnings that we um, learned from this uh, technology is it's relatively easy and, and as um, Alexina said, um, pretty inexpensive way to increase line capacity on identified facilities. It is a targeted approach, um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a quick way to do it. Um, we're seeing about the same percentage increase, really not a large data, data set, but approximately 43%. And then, you know, they meet, um, the first quarter 881 requirements. It gives us, um, using the drone install, it's really flexible, especially in Minnesota where there's some really swampy right-of-ways. So, um, you know, we can use um, track vehicles and, um, you know, just bring the drone operator out there to install. And then um, currently um, we're working actually on the integration. We can get the data from the Heimdall Cloud, but we're really working on the DMP protocol development so that we can scan their cloud like a virtual RTU and bring it into our EMS system and then share that with MISO um, and other of our utility partners so that they can get the benefit too and, and utilize that data. So that's all I got, Bryce. Thanks for the opportunity again. And thanks to uh, all the other speakers. I learned a lot today. Thanks to all. Uh, really great set of innovation that's happening. Um, I think our our work our our closing uh, encouragement is let's keep this up. Uh, thank you to the DOE office for the liftoff report. Um, if anybody would like to check out uh, that report, please do send it to friends and peers. We will follow up uh, with the recording of today's session, and if you have any other additional. Uh, questions, um, feel welcome to send those over to us. Any final things, David, to close up? No, that's it. Just uh, watch uh, by the end of next week, we should have this available as well as a recap of this section and the last session in this series. If you have thoughts or comments or questions, get them on over to us. We can get them to the right people or places. Uh, thank you for listening in and have a good rest of your day. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thank you.
sehr.